Well, good afternoon. On behalf of our Board of Trustees, the faculty and staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2018 State of the University Address. I want to thank Dr. Block for his hospitality in hosting the event here uh, in Stanton Gerber Hall. I want to thank Dr. Stanton for being present with us. So much of what I have the honor to walk through today exists because of the foundation that was built under his leadership. And I think we all should take a moment to thank Dr. Stanton for what he has done and continues to do for this university. Now, this is a different setting. Uh, traditionally, this would occur in the Culp Center. And we would gather in the Culp Center and walk through material that tells the story of the university. I would have somewhere between 60 and 90 slides, and I would move through them quickly. That's consistent. I think the count as of close was at 82. So we'll move through those data points with pace, even though we are in a different setting. And I want to just set the stage for the things that we're going to discuss today. We're going to provide an overview of enrollment, budgets, and student success data. We're going to talk some about institutional strategic planning efforts. We're going to provide some peer comparisons. But then I want to set things within a cycle of seasons. The two pictures that are on this slide are intentional because they show our campus in spring and in winter. And in the winter picture, there's a piece of our campus that's no longer here, but it will carry forward in spirit. And this cycle of the seasons is important, because in this era in which everything in our country seems to be hyper-politicized, there's a lot of consistency to the things that we do. And in this cycle of the seasons, if we can stay focused on mission, that mission will cycle through. And that mission traces its roots back to our founding. For those of you who are waiting for how long it would take me to say the following, it's three minutes. East Tennessee State University was founded in 1911 for a singular purpose, to improve the quality of life for the people of this region. Sidney Gilbreth established that mission. Over nine presidents, that mission has remained constant. And it's a mission that I hope will remain constant for the years to come, a mission of changing the way that people look at this region and changing the conditions of this region. That is why we're here. Here's our strategic plan. It's a strategic plan that was approved by the board at their very first meeting. It's a strategic plan that focuses on that mission and on that vision. It's a strategic plan that is now supported by a decentralized budget model. But it's a strategic plan that, at full implementation, is a shared governance plan, because it's a plan that is critical for every single person in this room to be a part of that plan if that plan will be successful. You're all familiar with our vision and values. And if we can live our values, the things that we're going to talk through today and in the days and years to come will take care of themselves. And that's people come first, and they're treated with dignity and respect. I think we live those values at this institution, and we live them every day of the week. I'm proud of the mission. I'm proud of the values. And I always want to ensure that we keep those value principles in front of us. Here's the six pillars of the strategic plan. And then here's the vision that we've established for ourselves at the close of the planning cycle. If we're able to live those values, if we're able to embrace our mission, if we're able to move through the elements that are now in college and unit plans, this is the vision we've set for ourselves. And it's an aggressive vision. 18,000 students, 2,000 transfer students, graduate 60% of the students who begin their experience at this institution, $60 million in externally sponsored research, $25 million in giving, and to be recognized as a great college to work for. These are the goals that we set for ourselves, goals that were affirmed by the board. So let's talk about where we are. I really love this picture, particularly as a setting for budgets, because one pot of gold somewhere here in Stanton Gerber, and the other pot of gold is in Fred Warren's golf practice facility. But somewhere on this campus, on this day and time, there was a pot of gold. As we look at the outlook for higher education, according to Moody's, there are some things that are moving through the landscape 
that provide both stability as well as unpredictability. The stability is that state revenues and tax revenues are much more positive than they had been if we were looking at Moody's report for higher education a decade ago. But elements in the national sphere, particularly a changing focus around immigration, has the ability not only to impact enrollment, but employment for those students who pursue their dreams at our institutions. Within the Tennessee budget landscape, the budget is solid. Our tax estimates continue to run ahead of projections. We're making investments into rainy day funds. You'll see that the state has put more than $20 million of new operating investments in our institution alone during Governor Haslam's administration. But as we look forward and plan, it is planned that at some point in the early 2000s, the economy will turn. And if you're a state such as ours that is heavily reliant upon sales tax, that recession comes to us before it comes to other states. So we constantly need to be prepared and to be wise stewards of our resources because it's not always going to be the way it is today. We must prepare for the inevitable because sooner or later it will begin to rain. That is the importance of investing in reserves. That's why we invested in reserves last year and we invested in reserves again this year. As we look forward in terms of tuition and fee anticipation with THEC, last year they set a cap at 3% and I anticipate uh, tuition and fee caps this year will be somewhere similar. Also anticipate that there will be stable and predictable funding for capital. We're in a very unique period of time at this institution. As I drove over today, I looked at the progress being made on the Martin Center, the first academic building built on the main campus since the library, the first classroom building built on the main campus since the dome. We're living in an environment in which that building, in which Lamb Hall, in which Building 60, in which the Culp Center are all coming together at one time. That hasn't happened at our university since the 60s and 70s. There's some growing pains associated with it. At least we found the dynamite that was left over from the 70s in the Culp. But there is stable support for capital construction at this point in time, and we all should be thankful for that. I referenced this slide earlier. During the period in which I've had the honor to serve as your president, the state has invested more than $20 million in operating revenues in our university. Most states in the nation are unable to tell that story. Now, the bulk of these investments come in the form of salary, but those that come in the form of operating are predicated upon the outcomes formula. And you see here the changes that have occurred in outcomes funding for the university. As a reminder, here are the variables upon which that outcomes funding is distributed, and here's our performance along those variables. So here's the criteria, here's our performance. I wanna thank Dr. Hoff, Dr. Bach, and others who've led our strategic planning efforts. The top two trend curves are increases in number of baccalaureate degrees, increases in number of graduate and professional degrees. We've increased the number of students graduating from our university, and we have been rewarded for that in terms of the outcome formula by the state. Overall, here's total revenue per student. So from 2007 to now, we have a little bit more per student to operate the institution, but as we know, the bulk of those revenues are coming from tuition and fees. Even though the state has increased its support, it's still nowhere near where it was when we were in college. This trend line is familiar to everyone. Our tuition and fees have increased on a regular basis, but those fee increases have been minimal the past three years. Last year, 3%. This year, I think it'll be less than 3%. So we're trying to hold down the cost to be efficient with the resources we have. But we're still below average in terms of our peers. We're still below the state average. I draw your attention to UT Knoxville. Look at tuition and fee structures at Knoxville. It's north of $12,000 you're seeing a significant number of students coming to this institution from Knox County, particularly high achieving students, because they're realizing the return on the investment here. But you see across the state, we're right about where we should be. Now, I have the honor to serve on the board of the American Council for Education. And at the ACE meeting last week, they shared this data with us. And this data is one of many data points where I'm asking for your help. I alone cannot tell the story of this institution. In fact, if you pull up our annual report, our annual report says our story, and if you zoom in in white, it's your story. This is one of many misperceptions about higher education. When ACE surveyed the general public, 72% of the general public thought that students borrowed to go to college. The actual number nationally for public institutions is 42%. 
And when ACE asked the question, what's the average debt burden for a college graduate? The response was $79,000. Here's our data. 54% of the students each December and May who walk across the stage, shake my hand and receive their degree, graduate with debt. The average debt load is $27,000 a year, less than the price of a new Honda Civic. Now, I'm an optimist, so let's look at that data the other way. Let's round down a little bit. Half the students graduate with debt. The other half of the students graduate with no debt at all. So when we talk about higher education and affordability, and you hear stories at the grocery store that college isn't possible, folks can't go, everyone graduates with debt, that's not true. Half the students who graduate from this university graduate with no debt at all. The other half of the students graduate with debt that, if properly balanced, is manageable. So where do our revenues come from? The bulk of our revenues come from tuition and fees. And here you see the distribution of tuition and fees in terms of in-state, out-of-state debt service, et cetera. Here's where our revenues go. The bulk of our expenditures are in people. 70% of every dollar we spend, we invest in our people. And you see that in restructuring, research, service, et cetera. The scholarship numbers have grown over time, and they're a function of our enrollment strategy to bring more students to this institution. I want to spend a moment on our budget landscape. Um, we have a trustee who's an auctioneer, and I know in some of these slides I'm going at the pace of an auctioneer, but I'm going to slow here by design. I want to thank everyone in the room and thank those who may be watching online for your patience as we've transitioned to a new budget model. If you go back to President Dossett, from Dossett forward, we had centralized budgeting, budgeting in which everyone looked to the CFO and to the president's office for revenues. This is year two of a decentralized budget model. There's going to be some bumps in the road as we go through that process. And I thank you for your patience as we grow into that process together. But I'm here to tell you that the process is working. This year, by the end of this week, you'll receive a memo from Dr. B.J. King that provides clarification to each of the colleges around revenue from fallout that will be transitioned back to the colleges. More than $1 million in revenue will make its way back to the colleges as a result of your financial stewardship, your investment, your patience, your leadership, that hasn't happened in my lifetime. That fallout money has gone back to the colleges. That's a sign that the model is working. Another sign that the model is working is last year, several million dollars of revenue was distributed across the campus based upon enrollment growth. Now, I know everyone wants information immediately, but we're trying to ensure that when budget information is distributed, that it's clear and it's consistent. Our budgets are balanced. We put money in reserves. We repaid ourselves for the acquisition of the Millennium Center, which we acquired yesterday. And we're moving things forward. This isn't a story that you see at many institutions. Putting money in reserves, investing in our people, providing fallout revenues back to the colleges. Our ability to continue these trend lines forward isn't predicated on Nashville. It's a function of the individuals in the room. We have to grow. We've got to grow enrollment. We've got to grow programs. We've got to implement the strategic plan. And if we're able to implement the strategic plan, we'll continue to be able to tell this story year after year after year. But I can't stress clearly enough, our budgets are balanced. For the fifth time in six years, we've provided salary enhancements across the campus. We're giving revenue back to the colleges. And we will very quickly provide revenue distributions based upon current enrollment as soon as we have a chance to finalize the data. So now let's talk about student success. And if Bucky jumps out from behind the walls with symbols, I'm going to throw this at him. <laughs> but the landscape is moving. You see on the top report, recent study by the Heckinger Institute, talks about shifts in demographics. The landscape's becoming much more competitive. We as a university shifted east in the face of Tennessee Promise. But you see now North Carolina Promise has been launched with a significant growth at Western Carolina University. So we have to be nimble, and we have to be proactive as we're shaping our enrollment strategies for the years to come. But enrollment growth is more than first year freshmen. Enrollment growth is transfer, it's graduate students, it's new programs, and we'll talk about that in a second. Here's overall enrollment for last year. Here's our overall enrollment last year from THEC. I had hoped to give updated enrollment at a statewide level now. One of the unfortunate consequences of the change in focus is data just isn't available the way it used to be. However, I do have current year data from the Board of Regents, and I want to thank Dr. Russ Deaton at the Board of Regents for making this data possible. I think it's important for us to have a context of what's happening around the state. 
because we cannot plan in a vacuum. So across the state, here's what's happening in the board system. So in the community colleges and TCATs, they're up a little bit. 88,000 students enrolled, blues headcount, the red is FTE. But you can see they're still not where they were post-recession. Here's freshman numbers. This slide's powerful. Promise has normalized. We now have predictability with respect to what Promise is doing to decisions for high school seniors. You can see the evolution. You can see the escalation. But now the landscape has normalized. About 19,000 freshmen in the region's system. New entrant this fall, Tennessee Reconnect. Reconnect has made it possible for non-traditional and adult students to attend community colleges and TCATs at no cost if they have some college but no degree. Now, some have said that's going to take the market, but it's not, because look at the numbers at the bottom of the slide. 27 million people in this nation have some college but no degree. And adult students are focused on quality, return on investment, and how that investment is going to impact their ability to move their family's fortunes forward. That's where we have a lot of latitude in this market, even in the face of ReConnect. Here's a little bit of information on Promise students. And the more you pay attention to these numbers, Promise students don't look that much different than ETSU students. And here's what happens with Promise students. This is important because more students who go to a community college via Tennessee Promise are staying, are graduating, and are looking to transfer. So Promise has impacted outcomes, and those outcomes have the ability to impact this institution. It's achieved its goal. More students are going to college. More students are graduating from college. It's all part of the Drive to 55 initiative. So the takeaways from us, we have more students who are transferring. They're younger. They're transferring with more credits. That impacts credit hour distribution, particularly in colleges like arts and sciences, which we may have to look at as we examine the implementation of the model and how shifts in the landscape around us may impact the model and its distribution. And Promise students are more likely to be full-time and then coming to us and staying through to graduation. So here's our numbers for the fall. I want to draw your attention to the first bullet. This is the largest class of graduate students in the history of the university. That is a success point. It's a point that exists because of individuals in this room. It's a point that exists because we have relevant programs that individuals value. Largest graduate program enrollment in the history of the university. We're a destination institution for out-of-state students. We're a destination institution for individuals who are looking to major in the health sciences. The national and state landscape continues to impact us. You'll see that if we'd been able to hold our own on international students, we actually would have been up. But on that decline of 35 overall, we're up 20-some in FTE, so we're essentially flat. I'm hopeful that the process improvements that are coming in through the CRM and financial services, financial aid, et cetera, will allow us to move these numbers. When a student expresses interest in ETSU, we need to treat that student as if they're the most valuable student in the world, not have them fall through the cracks. And we're all aware of students who fall through the cracks in process. So I thank you for the work that you're going to do to look at your own processes to ensure that from beginning to end, we work through students, we work with students, and we put them in a position to be successful. And I want to thank the individuals who are involved in the CRM process for their leadership. Here's our enrollment characteristics. Freshman numbers are down just a little bit, but the academic profile of the freshman class has increased. For the scholarship numbers behind me, you see increases in presidential, increases in provost, increases in dean scholarships. These are students with 27, 28, 29, 30 ACTs. These are the best of the best in the state of Tennessee and in the South, and they're coming here, and they're coming here in increasingly larger numbers. Once again, that's reflective of the academic quality of this institution. It's a very different ETSU than it was 15 years ago. 15 years ago, we did not see these significant numbers of high-end, high-achieving academic students that we do today. And if you were to ask someone in the general public, and I've done this, what do you think the average GPA of an ETSU freshman is? Say about a 2.9. It's a 3.5. The ACT score is almost a 24 if we were to round up. Now let's talk a little bit about transfer. Everyone has said, well, Promise will save the institution when all those students transfer. You see our transfer numbers have increased. 319 students transferred to the university from Northeast. And you see those transfer numbers all down the uh, perspective. Transfer students are increasingly important to this institution, but transfer goes both ways. Northeast sent 319 students to us. 
we sent 200 students to Northeast. And look at the number of students who left this institution to go to Knoxville. So once again, that customer service orientation, how can we ensure that those students who began here have an ex a successful experience here? There's a lot of swirl for those of you who are scholars of higher education. Cliff Edelman, the longtime scholar at NCES, talked about the swirl in higher education. You see that swirl here reflected on this chart. Here's where our students come from. Look at the international numbers, down 121. That's the impact of national policy on this university. And you see the numbers across the region. You see the North Carolina numbers down. That's North Carolina policy's impact on our region. So as we look and plan and look forward, we cannot plan in isolation. We must be mindful of the variables that exist around us. Largest number of applications to this institution come from Knox County. That's powerful. We are no longer an institution of Washington County, Sullivan County, Carter, Unicoi. We're an institution with an increasingly broad and diverse footprint. Now here's our top 10 feeder schools. They're still from here. And here's where I need your help. These students go to church with you. They live in your communities. They may serve you in restaurants. Talk to them about this institution. Pride in this university doesn't begin at 8.30 and end in 4.30 and just run Monday through Friday. I recently had the opportunity to attend a sporting event. And I've got to admit, I was a little disappointed in the number of ETSU employees who wore a color of another university. We're all part of the fabric of this institution. And you've got to carry that fabric and carry that story with you everywhere you go. I alone can't tell the story. Ramona Williams and her staff alone can't tell the story. All of us together have to tell the story of excellence that exists at ETSU. Here's our retention rates, continued upward trend meeting the trend lines that we expect in our strategic plan. And here's the comparatives for the state as a whole. Here's our graduation rates. Look at that jump. It's not easy to move a graduation rate four percentage points. Why have we moved graduation rates to that extent? They're still not where they need to be. Remember our strategic planning goal is 60%. But we've made movement because of the investments that we've made in advising. We've made movement because of the investments that we've made in living learning communities. There's not one silver bullet that addresses any single instance on a campus. It's a profile of services that involves everyone in this room that helps allow us to achieve our strategic planning goals. But you can see we're making progress. And then here's that data at a statewide level. This past year, we graduated more students than we ever have in the history of the university. Look at that growth in the number of students who walk across the stage, going back from the 90s all the way to today. More than 3,400 students graduated from this institution. But I want to spend a second on this slide, because quite often we think of students walking across the stage in a simple way, baccalaureate degrees. What this slide shows you is the complexity of ETSU. We're different than other universities in the state. The presence of the Health Science Center, our graduate and professional programs, is personified here. Outside of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and the Health Sciences Center in Memphis, there's no other institution in the state that produces the number of graduates and professional degrees that we do. And look at the number of master's degrees that we produce. Right there with Middle, even though Middle has 10,000 more students than we do. So this is an institution that has lots of untold stories. And I'm coming back to that again and again and again. Everywhere I go, folks say, Brian, you got to do a better job telling the story. You need to market yourself. I promise you we're going to have billboards all over the place. We may not spend money on anything else, but we're going to buy some billboards. <laughs> but billboards aren't going to get the message out. I need your help telling the story of this institution, of our complexity and the quality of our academic programs. Next strategic pillars on diversity. We're all familiar with this data. It's from ACE. It's the same at a national level as it is here. Students from low-income families have a lower probability of going to college. African-American students have a lower probability of going to college. Students from rural communities have a lower probability of going to college. That's our region. So here's our enrollment data. We're diversifying our enrollment footprint, but once again, the international numbers impact things. But you can see across all spectrums, we're moving in the direction we should. However, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do as it relates to student success. Nationally, almost 40% of African-American students graduate, 48% of Hispanic and Latina students. Here's our numbers. The 33.7% for African-American students is an increase over the 20-some percent of last year, 
but we clearly have a lot of work to do to ensure that all students who begin their educational journey at this university have the opportunity to realize their dreams. Next strategic planning pillar is on supporting our employees. Our salaries aren't where they need to be, but our ability to move salaries is not simply predicated on the state. One of the benefits of the decentralized model is it provides the opportunity for colleges to pilot and for colleges to innovate. This year, we have a college led by Dr. Dan, Don Samples, the College of Clinical and Rehabilitative Health Sciences, that is providing differentiated salary adjustments for their faculty and staff based upon the leadership that they've provided within that unit. That same flexibility is available to the entire campus, and I think you'll see more colleges being able to reinvest their resources in their faculty and staff as the model begins to mature. We didn't get into this overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight. One thing that I think for me is really a, a wonderful takeaway is the fact that we've said we're going to be open, transparent, and inclusive. We're going to survey people, and we're going to share the data, whether it be good or whether it be bad. For the past five years, we've participated in the Great Colleges to Workforce survey done by the Chronicle. This is the first year in which our overall score is equal to that of our Carnegie benchmark. And look at the improvements across almost every single area. Job satisfaction's up, teaching environment's up, professional development, facilities, pride. Look at the growth that we all have in terms of pride in this institution. Now, we all know from graduate school, from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that salary isn't the primary motivator. The primary motivator is that you as an individual have a connection to the mission of the institution. You see how your work makes a difference in the things that we do. And that, for me, is what's predicated through here. Now, I realize my approval rating slipped this year over last by one point, um, but I also see that communication continues to be a challenge. I think communication is always a challenge when you have 15,000 students and 2,600 faculty and staff. Someone doesn't feel properly communicated to. But communication isn't just myself alone. Communication is all of you going back and telling your peers, here's what we heard at the State of the University address. All of these slides will be made public as soon as this presentation is done, so you can point people to it. The full results of this survey, Dr. Hoff and his staff will release shortly. Next pillar, supporting teaching and research. I tell students at recruiting events with frequency that we're a big college. We have all the moving parts. We're a major comprehensive research institution, but it's still small enough to feel like a family. That's referenced in the 16 to 1 slide. Our student-faculty ratio is 16 to 1. The predominance of our courses, 70% rounding up, are taught by full-time faculty. So you have a small college feel in a major college environment. And look at that 44 million number, $44 million worth of extramural funding at this institution last year. We're already making significant progress towards that strategic planning goal of $60 million. Stewardship of place. If I had a dollar for every time I said stewardship of place, I could buy everyone the official Diet Pepsi of East Tennessee State University. And there'll be about four or five more by the time we're done. But within stewardship of place, I draw your attention to the $38 million worth of scholarships that we invested in our students. The number of students taking dual enrollment courses, our Roan Scholars Program. Stewardship of place is also reflected in the quality of our academic programs. Go back to the founding of this institution in 1911. What was a part of the institution? The normal school. That normal school has now evolved into the university school, which is the number 14 school in the state of Tennessee. Top five program in the nation in public health. Number 14 program in the nation in physical therapy. The College of Medicine is top 10 in the country for its focus on rural and family practice. Our doctoral program in ed leadership is top 20 in the country. Our College of Nursing is top 20 in the country. And our digital media program is 31 in the nation. And these are just a few that I put on the slide. There's more and more and more of those. I put the quality of this institution up against any other, and it's reflected in these rankings. But more importantly, it's reflected in what we do. Because if we have outstanding rankings, but we don't make a difference in the lives of the people of the region, we've let everyone down. And you see here the difference we make. 58,000 community service hours by our student groups more than 290,000 patients seen by our physicians and our nurses in our clinics. $2 million in uncompensated care provided to the people of this region who have health care needs. For many, if it were not for ETSU, they would not have the opportunity to see a doctor or a nurse. 
and our nurse managed clinics, we are the healthcare safety net for this region. So let's talk a little bit about some academic initiatives. I shared these slides with the Board of Trustees at our meeting a week and a half ago. I have two slides full of selected initiatives. These aren't all. These are just some things that I've highlighted. First is enrollment. We have to grow. If we're going to address the challenges that exist at this institution in terms of salary, et cetera, we've got to grow our way out of the problem. The last thing I want to do is cut our way to excellence. You've got to grow your way to excellence. That's not only freshman enrollment, that's retention, that's persistence, that's new programs. The retreat of the Academic Council this past week, the work that Dr. Susan Epps is leading, is focused on identifying new academic programs, repackaging existing programs that allow us to grow. We've got to continue to implement the new budget model. We may have to make some tweaks or adjustments there, but as that model begins to, begins to mature, colleges will have the opportunity to reinvest resources into themselves. This fall, we'll roll out key performance indicators that align with the master plan. For the past four years, this presentation's been all the data you get. That's getting ready to change because within the next couple of months, Dr. Hoff will release data that allows you to look at comparisons to peers, comparisons to colleges, and drill down at the departmental level, similar to the things we used to be able to do when we ran the Delaware Cost Study. Data informs decision making, decision making informs the plan. You're going to see us realign and adjust some of the work that we do in Title IX. The next bullet, the first day of school, told us all we need to know about the focus on campus safety. I want to take a moment to thank Chief Collins and her staff for the work that they did. Um, that was a great learning experience for all of us. In many respects, it was a tabletop exercise that allowed all of us to think of what would happen in the event of something catastrophic on this campus. And you're going to see Chief and the staff pursue national accreditation. The Gen Ed slide will be here this year, next year, and the year after that because it's a three-year process, but it's an opportunity for us to reimagine our Gen Ed core. It's fitting and appropriate that here in this hall we talk about ETSU Health and the partnership with Ballard. I want to applaud Dr. Bishop and all the deans in the health sciences for the work that they've done in AIM, one of only three institutions in the country that have engaged in a nationally recognized strategic planning process that allows us to envision a new future for the health sciences here, really bringing together our nurse managed clinics, our MEAC clinics, and all the clinical operations of the institution so that we become the practice of choice. If I'm ill, if my family's ill, if something happens to Don or Jackson, they should go to an ETSU physician. We should become the practice of choice, and that's what ETSU Health will lead us towards. We're going to continue to work on capital projects. We're going to work on capital projects for a while, so kind of get used to the cones and the fences, because as soon as we get the culp done, we're going to start on Lamb Hall. And as soon as we get Lamb Hall done, assuming THEC comes forward in the way that we should, we'll take the university center to the ground, and we'll build a new humanities building. That's a good problem to have, but it's a problem nonetheless. I will, later this week, formally release to the campus a presidential fellows program that will provide opportunities for strategic development, the next generation of leadership on our campus. And then you'll see us this year launch a capital campaign under the leadership of Pam Ritter and her staff that will allow us to bring additional resources to bear that align with the master plan. Here's what we're going to push for in the General Assembly. And it will be an interesting year in Nashville because there'll be so many new faces. My hope is that they carry forward the legacy of investment that Governor Haslam has provided and that we're able to realize permanent funding for the College of Pharmacy and some capital projects. So now I'm going to shift. I'm going to make a hard shift because I want to talk about the things that are happening around us and how we as an institution have the ability to control our narrative. I mentioned the cycle of seasons, the two pictures in my first chart. The American Association of State Colleges and Universities each year puts out a top 10 list. Now this isn't the funny David Letterman top 10 list, this is a top 10 list for geeks like me. But these are the top 10 policy issues facing American higher education, 2008 to 2018, a 20-year com comparative. Look at the consistency, immigration, immigration, safety, guns on campus, affordability, state financial aid programs. As much as things change, they stay the same. But things around us are changing. And one of the areas that is of significant concern to me is the public narrative around higher education is increasingly negative. If you look at institutions in this state, there are major universities in this state that are wrestling with the public narrative that surrounds them. 
and the way in which institutions are viewed by the general public is increasingly critical because of this narrative. And it's a narrative that I'm going to play through for a little bit. But look at the 18 to 34 year olds. That's our market. That market increasingly views higher education as not worth the investment. It costs too much. It's not worth it. I don't understand that because we all know that as educational attainment increases, earnings increase. Your likelihood of full employment throughout your life increases. But most Americans say that higher education is headed in the wrong direction. Irrespective of party, this isn't a political statement, it's the facts. This is what America thinks about higher education. We're headed in the wrong direction. Some individuals believe that stronger than others. But let's drill down. This is brand new survey research from Pew, partially because they think costs are too much. We're not preparing students with relevant skills they need to be successful in the workforce. Some view we're overly protective of what we teach in the classroom, and others think we bring our views into the classroom. Now, whether or not we agree with these data or not, these data define the reality in which we work, in which we live, in which we exist. They increasingly define the narrative about higher ed. But if we could do some things proactively, they'll not define the narrative about this university. And here's some more data along that similar theme. So people question who we are, what we're doing, and why. We live in an era where there's a rise of populism, a rise of anti-intellectualism, if we do the things we're capable of doing and focus on mission, that noise will drown itself out for our region. We all know that higher education plays a critical role in the knowledge economy, our ability to grow jobs, expand the quality of life, enhance social variables, enhance population health, is focused on people getting degrees beyond high school. And that then links to stewardship of place. So we're now at Diet Pepsi number three or four. I lost count. These statistics define our region. They've defined our region for generations, from JFK's visits to the coal fields, to LBJ's Great Society, to Vance's hillbilly elegy. This is how the nation views us. We're good at all the things you shouldn't be good at. And you see the impact here. This is our data compared to national averages. Our poverty rates are 30% higher. Our life expectancy is 20% less. Now let's jump in a little bit. Here's national population health rankings. We're in the bottom 10 of the country in the state of Tennessee. There's a lot of talk about the opioid epidemic in our region. It's on the front of everyone's agenda. We talk about it in church. We talk about it at the institution. We've opened a clinic, the Overmountain Clinic in Gray, to address that epidemic. Some have asked why. Here's why. Look at the predominance of dark colored counties. That's home. So as an institution, we can hide from the mission or we can embrace our mission. I think we need to do more than the Over Mountain Clinic. Our ability to address the opioid epidemic could be predicated on research, it could be predicated on service, it could be predicated on education, because this just isn't an epidemic of individuals that you see wandering the streets. It's an epidemic that's more than 2,000 feet away. Because if today's anything like yesterday, or the day before the day before, half the children in the NICU at Nicewanger are suffering from NAS. And look at how different our region looks than the rest of the state. We have a moral and social imperative to focus on our mission to make a difference in these statistics. Because in three years, they're going to be in preschool. In five years, they're going to be in elementary school. And they're going to roll through the system. The only way we break away from this generation of despair is to embrace our mission. You see it in poverty. Where's red? Home. You see it in education, where's red? Home. You see it at the college level. Here it's the darker shade. What's dark? Here. But this is a slightly different slide with a slightly different color criteria. This slide shows growth. In 2007, there was one county in our region that was growing. It was Washington County. Now fast forward to 2015, there's not a single county in the area that we call home that's growing. Our region is suffering. Our mission is important. If we focus on our mission, that allows us to drown out all the noise of higher education is lost. We're doing all these things we shouldn't do. We're bringing politics in the classroom. Ignore it. As I said at the opening, focus on mission. These demographic data represent the narrative of central Appalachia. But it's not a current narrative. It's a generational narrative. 
but we've got all the moving parts to fix it. From education to the College of Medicine to the College of Pharmacy to the College of Public Health to increasing programs in graduate studies to the work that you do across the board in service, that's our mission. And our mission's bigger than just ensuring that we have 18,000 students. Our mission and our success is going to be defined by expanding programs and services that impact this region. Why do we want to create ETSU Health? Because we want to be the practice of choice. Ultimately, we want to change this narrative. Why did we open the Overmountain Clinic? Because we have a responsibility to make a difference in the region. This year, we've got to do a better job of telling our story. We don't catalog or, cry or, or put any type of criteria together that counts this stuff. And I'm not saying you should count everything, but if we're going to convey to the people of the region what we do, we probably ought to have some type of report that we could put in front of folks and say, here's what we do. So from a faculty perspective, we need to look at how we account for faculty productivity, faculty activity, not because we're trying to track things, because we have a story to tell. And if we can tell that story, it changed the narrative about our institution. And as we look through this, for me, there's a lot of wonderful stories at our university. I love the stories of graduation. And what I really love at graduation is the opportunity to see the number of our employees who walk across the stage, be they individuals such as Lindsay Devine or Brittany Azell, who received their doctorate degrees at this institution, or individuals who work for our fiscal plant, who went through a GED program at no cost, then slowly but surely chipped away at their college criteria and received their degree. There's an individual who has worked with Donna on Bucky's Food Pantry, who every single semester has chipped away at his degree. He walked across the stage in May, shook my hand, and received his degree in engineer technology. I couldn't be more proud of him. Think of the students whose lives you transform. Think of the way in which we impact this region. Today, as we speak, one of the individuals who was an employee, who took advantage of the benefits that we have, a couple thousand feet away, he and his wife are having their first child. Matt, if you're watching this, congratulations. But Matt McGahee's child is going to come into this world at the hands of an ETSU physician. It's going to be cared for by an ETSU nurse. When it goes to daycare, the probability that the faculty in that daycare were educated here is probably 100 to 1. When they go to elementary school, those elementary schools are going to be run by our graduates, and the cycle never ends. I experienced that cycle myself a number of years ago when I was in a very compromised position who pulled me out of my car? An ETSU graduate. Who cared for me in the hospital? An ETSU physician, one of our surgeons. Who read my screens? A radiologist who contributed to our athletic programs. Who cared for me in PT? Dr. Brian Johnson. And that's just me. Think of your families. You're hard pressed to not find a connection to your family, to this institution, even if you're new to this region. This institution is changing the future of your lives and of your families. And if you can't get excited about that, y'all, you're in the wrong place. Go wear the colors of some other school. But I'm proud of this school. I'm proud of what we do. I'm proud of our mission. And I firmly, firmly, firmly believe that if we implement the strategic plan, if we stay the course, if we're patient with one another, the model has some quirks we've got to work through. Some colleges may experience different elements than others this year, but we're going to provide a safety net so that the model is successful. But if we're patient with one another and we stick to the plan, I can assure you the state of this university is strong. And what I really look forward to more than anything else in the world is the opportunity to come back 20 years from now and sit where Dr. Stanton is sitting and to see that these numbers have changed. Because if these numbers change, if the opioid numbers change, if the educational attainment numbers change, if those numbers change, then we made an impact. The impact of us in this room isn't measured in buildings or square footage or fancy things that shine and move. The impact of the individuals in this room is a function of what you do in the lives of your students. And it's there I'm going to close. Six years ago, a student walked into my office at the end of the semester in the spring and told me that they were going to have to drop out of school because they didn't have enough resources to come back. That student and I struck a deal with one another that if they did certain things that I asked of them and checked in with me, that I would help them through the process. Ultimately, that student graduated from ETSU. Now that student's in graduate school at East Tennessee State University. Now that student is fully employed within our region 
and is realizing their dreams. What I enjoy most is not what that student has accomplished, it's watching that student pass along his gifts to the next generation, watching him serve as a role model to little kids across the region. That's what we do, be it training students for ROTC, training students for careers in nursing, or training students to move into whatever profession you represent. I think we have the best mission in all of higher education. I couldn't be more proud of our university. I ran longer than I wanted to, but I hope we have a little bit of time for questions. Thank you for all that you do for ETSU, and I'd be happy to address questions. So questions about anything? What did we do with the dynamite and the culp? Um, <laughs> I don't, Jeremy Ross is dealing with a few other things, so we can blame that one on Jeremy. Um, but a little bit of questions on anything. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned how national policies was uh, affecting enrollment, and you talked a little bit about uh, immigration. Uh, could you uh, explain that a little bit more? Well, I'm not stating that the entire reason for shifts in enrollment is a function of national, national policy or state policy. I'm just saying that policy matters. And as the state of North Carolina changed, it public, changed its public policy, we saw a decrease in enrollment. As we've looked at the ability of international students to come and pursue their dreams, not only here but across the country, as things have tightened, that has impacts. And that impact plays through the decreases in international enrollment at this institution. Does anybody else have a question? Other questions? Well, Dr. Block, thank you again for making this building available. Dr. Stanton, thank you for your leadership. All of these slides will be on the web, um, so the material is here. Next Monday at University Council, we'll have an open conversation, reflections on this data. Um, so I'm sure as you have a chance to digest it, there may be questions. I moved through quickly, but not as quickly as I did when we practiced. When we practiced, I did it in 36 minutes. Today, it took a little bit longer. Um, but I thank you all for what you do for the institution. Godspeed and go Bucks. <laughs>